Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 22. Even the CISA has a listicle. You won't believe number five. So my name is Hyam. Tom's there. He's hidden behind his new setup, it looks like. I, I see am. sparkly things. Uh, yes. So you will see sparkly things, but the people on, uh, on YouTube will not see sparkly things because I've changed the computer's lighting scheme to green. Uh, and because we're filtering out stuff that's green, because of the green screen, uh, you're not going to see that. Uh, you can kind of see, like, a, a corner, like right here. But, uh, but the rest of the computer, invisible. That's great. And I see a new chair. Uh, no, old chair, just different angle. So I actually had to redo this entire office. I have been using the same glass desk since college. Literally, I went to Staples. I bought it, uh, like from a, a friend who had like an employee discount there. I, it was forever ago, and it was college. Uh, but I, that thing has survived through like six different moves. It's it's insane. The desk is just a beast. It's really cheap. It's super flimsy, but you know, it works. So uh, I sat. I built this new computer, and I sat it down on top of the glass desk, and I just didn't feel good about that it's a very thin glass desk it's been through the ringer it's it has been back and forth across the country twice now i don't want to put my brand new computer on top of that flimsy glass so i had to buy a new desk and because of the new computer and the new desk i had to rearrange the office and then that took some time so uh, you can you can blame one of the weeks that we weren't here uh, directly on me because I was tearing apart and rebuilding this entire room. Uh, but it's done now. We're here uh, and it should be good now. Uh, hopefully I'm still still trying to figure it, out the camera placement. Is it a standing desk? It is not. It is a just okay. basic bare bones metal and wooden desk. Uh, the the uh, desk behind me. The, the the desk behind me is a standing desk that my uh, my sister said her company bought, but she doesn't want a standing desk either. <laughs> and so, yes, it moves up and down, but I'm like, I'm never going to stand and work at a computer. Like, never, ever, mm. ever, ever going to do it. So I don't know why we have this, but okay, more power to those who want it. I don't want it. So I, I have my... So I, I actually have a, a standing system upstairs. It's just one of the, the spring-loaded ones that you yeah. pull up and it raises the entire thing to meet you. And I use it a couple times a month. It's certainly not very often. I'm exceptionally lazy. I don't know if it's a lazy thing. It's like I, I'm focused on work now and, yeah. and I don't want to put a treadmill underneath <laughs> me while I'm focusing <laughs> on work um or anything else i want to sit my desk is actually an, is an ikea desk it's been i don't know it's probably 10 years old now uh it's working i don't know i just i went from two monitors to one monitor anyway so i know that you can't go more than two once you go more than two you need like a big setup yeah you, you need the laptop. arms and yeah so i have a 24 inch i i could get another one but it's I really just want like a 19 inch on the side, mm -hmm. like a small, yeah. like a small thing just for the social medias. And then I'm like, why am I social media while I'm writing papers? Like I, I, I don't need that. So anyway, yeah. all right. Anyway, let's move on. So again, this is cybersecurity awareness month. And in the, in, in the, I, the whole like theme of all of this, uh, CISA uh, sent out. And by the way, now I have the actual, uh, what's it called? The phrasing. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, sent out the top 10 most uh, cybersecurity misconfigurations. So we were going to talk about that today. And nothing is really like standing out on this list, but all of these things I'm guilty of. So I think we should talk about them. So I will start with number one. And I don't think they're in any order. Uh, default configurations of software and applications. You get a you get a piece of software, you or your router, hardware, whatever it is. You just say, "Oh, we'll we'll deal with we'll deal with fixing things later, and we don't change from default." And then you get hosed. Always change right away. Take the time to focus on the security right away. Change that default password. 
Uh, now, one of the things I do want to point out is that uh, this has actually gotten better uh, over the past decade or so, uh, probably even longer than that. Uh, it used to be that when you bought like a, a Wi-Fi router, you didn't have any password at all on it, right? It was just totally open. So people would buy this, plug it in, hook it up, and now open Wi-Fi for everyone to use, uh, which can be dangerous. And, at, you know, it, at the worst case, it can be very dangerous, like police visiting your house if somebody says the wrong thing on the internet using your connection. Um, but most of the time, it was just people, you know, using your router to watch Netflix, just taking your bandwidth. Um, which you might be okay with, you might not. Uh, but now, like, a lot of consumer routers, they come out of the box, and you plug them in, and either it forces you through some sort of, like, tutorialized setup before the thing will even function, which is cool, uh, or it just automatically sets up a WPA2 network, and it's got a password on a sticker slapped to the bottom of the machine, and that is randomly generated which is fantastic. It means you're getting security out of the box by default. It's a randomized, pretty lengthy password, and yeah, that's going to be good enough for most use cases and most threat models. Uh, but uh, sadly, yeah, they're right. Uh, default creds exist everywhere. Uh, and unless you're going through and changing them, or unless the company is you know, doing their due diligence and making sure not to uh, sell their customers something that's potentially insecure uh yeah the stuff still happens i mean on the home side you're setting up something and you're like i'm gonna make big security this and that and now you have to type your wpa password in a million times and you get tired of it you're like fine i'll go to the default i'll figure it out once i figure out i promise i'll do it it's like 1 a.m and magic happens it works and you're like i'll do this in the morning and then you forget yeah, like that all oh, that that happens a lot. Uh, one one really kind of cool tip uh, is that you can actually embed your Wi-Fi SSID, the the network name, and the password into a QR code. Now, obviously, you know, don't paste this on the outside of your window or make a flag out of it or anything. But like, you can have a little sign or i've seen people like literally put it inside of a picture frame and hang it on the wall if you want a big long annoying stupidly complicated wi-fi password like i have but you don't want people to be annoyed by typing it in or just hand you the phone and say here you do it which is usually my job when new people come over to the house uh you can actually just post this qr code somewhere you know secure out of sight in your house and then one guest come over, whoever needs to access your network, they just scan the code and they're in. Uh, so you get, you know, all the niceties of having that big, long, complicated, secure password. Uh, but you also get the convenience of, hey, if somebody has access to that QR code, if they're inside your home, uh, they can access your network just by using their phone's camera. Doesn't work for all devices, obviously, like your Nintendo Switch is going to have a lot of trouble getting to that QR code. Uh, but, you know, for most phones, tablets, whatever, it's fine. Uh, and honestly, that kind of trade-off is fine for me. Uh, I'm actually going to 3D print uh, a Wi-Fi QR code sign that people can scan. Just because I'm iPhone, printing things. On, I know on the iPhones and the iPads, if, um, what's it called? If somebody has, if, if the contact is, if you have the contact in your phone, so you're at my house and we have contact and our contacts are exchanged. Sometimes it pops up and says, would you like to share this? And it, when it works, it's beautiful. I, sometimes it works. Most of the time it works. But when it doesn't, it's like, why isn't it working? And you don't know how to make it. But it does do that. But just still, even every configurable service has a username and password. And, and sometimes say, oh, well, it's internal to us and you have to be internal to access it. But then somebody throws it on the internet and that happens. But again, this is mainly for, 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 uh, for enterprise people, but just at home, your Wi-Fi router, anything you connect to the internet, please change the password. Uh, like you said, write it down, generate something long Put a QR code to it, take a picture of it, write it down in your phone, and then tape it to the bottom of whatever it is. Don't just leave it there because somebody will take it. You'll you want to show someone the Wi-Fi password and they'll take it and they won't put it back. So I really like that it's stuffed down there. Uh, number two, improper separation of user admin privilege. 
That sounds like a lot of words. Yeah, this one is definitely more of an enterprise bend, but if you wanted to, if you're okay with some annoyance, because this one comes with some annoyance, you can totally do this at home too. Um, so this is uh, referring to uh, like businesses that just give local admin to everyone, which, uh, you know, I, I have worked in IT before. I have absolutely had these conversations. Um, and, uh, you know, we give local admin to a lot of people. People need to install software to do their jobs. And, you know, the company doesn't provision all of it. People use a wide variety of software to do their jobs. And sometimes that requires admin access. And it's... It's annoying, but it's the reality of the job. Uh, but if your company just, you know, gives admin access to literally everyone by default all the time, no questions asked, might not be the best security posture to take. Um, and at, at home, if you wanted to, like, beef up your security, your, your local system security a little bit, you could even make a separate user that's limited access, that doesn't have these admin controls, and then when you did to change system settings or run patches or do anything like really hardcore sysadmin-y type maintenance tasks, you, you log out of your account or you switch accounts to the admin one, do what you have to over there, and then log out of it. Uh, there are some accounts, uh, just like you know social media things, uh, where... I have access, I have admin access to like Discord servers, for instance. Um, on the more important ones, I actually have a separated account that I never log into and it's literally just there to hold the admin access. So if I personally get hacked, they can do as much damage as regular moderators can to my systems, but they can't take over the server, uh, which is great because you need some way to get back in and clean things up. And of course, uh, regular support channels can help you if you run into this problem, but you don't want to have to go down that road. It's long and it's annoying and you don't want to do it. Um, I was so going to say, I, I was going to say, I, I don't know if I would recommend this at the home level, like to, to, to do it's this, pretty annoying. this. Yeah. It's really annoying. What I may do is I have two young kids there. They shouldn't be installing anything. I can make, they won't know that this is it. And students with Chrome, kids with Chromebooks, they only install Chrome apps. They don't know how to download anything. Like they can click here or whatever it is. So making them a modified user or a, or non-admin may actually work out for you. And then when they call, why isn't this working? You can then go in and do it. But I would not do it for any. Like I wouldn't do this for your tech liter your tech illiterate friends somewhere else because then you're always going to be called. It's we got to the point that people that that hacking a computer through not cl uh, clicking a malicious link is still there but it's not as prevalent as it used to be it's more this is more for the enterprise if you again if you think about what you're doing you're probably being okay but again this is for the enterprise and yes it is very important if you are an enterprise person to limit accounts don't say people are are going to behave because they're not yeah um, so, and you actually brought up a good point that I, I want to touch on a little bit. Try, if you are the tech person for your group of friends, your family, whatever, uh, if you're the person that gets those support calls, when you're making changes to other people's systems or making recommendations, this is going to sound kind of weird and a little selfish because it is kind of weird and a little selfish. Think about your support model, right? Like, you might absolutely love Debian. Just love it to pieces. I am a massive Debian fan. And there was a point in my life where I did push some friends and family to run Linux on their personal computers. And I was extremely busy because of that decision. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? If, if you like doing that stuff, if you're comfortable with it, fine, more power to you. But I it did get old for me. It could get old for you. So when when you think about, like, especially in terms of security, where you're removing some convenience to provide more security, think about your support model and think about how many calls or remote access sessions or uh, text messages you're going to get with questions. Uh, and that goes for really any and all tech support that you do. Uh, I know some tech people who said... I'm literally done with all of this. I'm only buying Apple products for all of my friends and family. Uh, look, I've, I've said that about Android phones and iPhones. I am, I look, I really do like Android. I really do. And I would like to, 
but at the end of the day, it was just not changing enough and then support with everyone else. And I said, I want iMessage on my Mac. I want these conveniences. Let's, I, I moved to the iPhone. I'm happy. And now I tell people, you want a phone? Get an iPhone. You can't afford it? Get a cheaper iPhone. Get get an older model, whatever it is. Or save up for it because you'll be able to keep it for five or six years or whatever it is. But anyway, this is a Thanksgiving conversation because we normally talk yeah. about this during Thanksgiving. So thir- number three, <laughs> insufficient. Teaser. Yes. Insufficient internal networking monitoring. Um, I'm just going to quickly say, because we're, we're, we're short on time, is that you're not checking your network as much as you should. And again, this is an enterprise thing, but if you have any any little uh, uh, not, uh, twisty things on your router to check things, you may want that. If you get a, a login that shouldn't be there or something else, turn it on. You don't necessarily have to check it, but every once in a while, let it notify you if it sees something odd. We, we can bend this one a little bit because it, it definitely is enterprise flavor. Um, if your networking equipment, if your, your home networking equipment has uh, like an auto update uh, feature, turn it on. That, that's, that's later. Don't, that, that's later. Oh, my bad. Sorry. Yeah. Spoilers. But basically, yes. Yes. <laughs> if, if, it's, if, if your network or whatever it is, your computer, or whatever, has some sort of monitoring that can, that can, that can like ping you when something's wrong, turn that on. That's it. That's it. Four, yep. lack of network segmentation. So that's the idea of, let's say, a guest network or a IoT network, which I have. A lot of the routers now have multiple networks, one for your main thing, your, your main life, and the other one for guests. Turn that on. Let the guests be on their own. Like there's a, What I do hate, and I don't know if everyone does this, but they used to do it, is the hotspot it's not called hotspot but it was like the, the captive portal thing the captive yeah. portal that's what it was those are terrible okay don't them. so you so ubiquity had this problem where you couldn't do guest network without captive portal and it's like no no i don't want the captive portal like like i'll limit them nobody ever says no i don't agree to these services <laughs> like we know don't do bad things criminals do bad things but i just wanted it they eventually like kind of sort of did it but if you don't have Captive Portal, it's really limited. But anyway, turn on Guest Network. It actually does work. It actually does segment everything off. It is a good thing. Turn it on. Tell your friends to go on the Guest Network. They won't be offended. Like, they won't. Uh, and just move on from there. They just want the Wi-Fi. They don't need access to your SAN. Yeah. I mean, if you're playing something where you're Chromecasting stuff, that's a different story. But... But don't do that. <laughs> or have anyway. Next one. Five. Poor patch management. There we go. Okay. Update your stuff. Yes. A, a lot of software has gotten really good and, and sometimes a little too overbearingly good. Uh Windows in particular is super, super annoying with how they have basically just removed a ton of control from the end user when it comes to how when and why their systems update. I know there's stuff you can do with group policy. We're talking about regular computer users right now, though. Um, so it's unfortunate that that is the direction Microsoft took. At the same time, automatic Windows updates. Like, I know if my friends and family are running Windows 10, Windows 11, they're going to get patched whether they want to or not. And, you know, the security person in me says, cool, that's great. I, I hate that it removes control from the end user, but it does go a long way to keeping people safe. And more and more software is auto-updating all the time. You know, you, you turn on your Chromebook, and guess what? You've got the latest version of Chrome OS. Uh, you know, your browser will say, hey, just click here to bounce the browser. We'll keep your tabs. Don't worry about it. Just hit the button. Uh, Signal popped up a thing literally 10 minutes ago saying, hey, click the blue button, dude. It's update time. So I clicked it. Anytime you're prompted like that, just do it. And if your software that you're using doesn't have some sort of auto update, check around for it because that's kind of weird. Uh, but also maybe think about going to a replacement or a competitor uh, just because not having any kind of auto update or notification about updates and software, I consider it kind of a red flag today. I was going to say, uh, 
it's when you installed your router. When was the last time you thought about it? Do you know how to even access your router? The technician came in, put it in. There is a sticker that says, go to this web address. For me, it's like my Verizon gateway and then put in the code that's on the sticker. But you want to hope that they turned on automatic updates. Now I checked and I think everybody knew. They they learned this. They learned their lesson to do this. So I have a feeling automatic updates is turned on. Even in the matter specification, that's the, all the little IoT things, anything that uses matter has to have automatic updates. And you should be looking for that. Don't turn it off. Go through it. Like the reason they do it is to protect you. I know the second Tuesday of every month, I think, just came last week i think last week no we had october was sunday so it came two weeks ago if you haven't updated like please spend the time like i know it's annoying but it is really really important and if you buy something look for automatic update if it doesn't have it return it find something else try or really make a point to keep it updated keep on checking once a week whatever it is okay six six uh Bypass of system access controls. I I don't exactly know how. This is this is past the hash. This is Kerberos yeah. hacking. This is enterprise. You don't really have to worry about this unless you are running a domain controller at home. You probably don't have to worry about past the hash attacks on your network from a dedicated threat actor. And if you do find a different podcast because you're way above our level no no join the signal group and i will once you join the signal group i will tell you one of our one of the members in there does a more enterprisey type security podcast he will be able more than able to help you anyway yeah. seven <laughs> uh, weaker misconfigured uh, multi-factor authentication we're not going to tell you how to configure multi-factor authentication we're just going to tell you to get two-factor authentication when you can we're not going to say here and say and say don't use text message authentication because if that's the only thing you have then use it otherwise if there's something stronger than that Six digit TOTP codes or or pass keys or YubiKeys, use that. Otherwise, otherwise, just have anything if you can. Uh, I'm going to hit you with a little unasked for education. This is actually pretty cool. So apparently, uh, according to this article, I didn't know this. I don't use smart cards, but um, you know, military and DoD networks uh, typically use smart cards. That I did know before reading this article, where you plug in something and it logs you into your account. Uh, apparently, if you have a configured password and a configured smart card, the password, depending on your settings, can still be active. So if a malicious actor gets into the network and they get that hash that they can pass around to move around to other systems, that can still be live. So even though you're not using the card, which is technically not MFA, depending on settings, uh, a lot of times I've seen those used as single factor authentication. No username, no password, plug in the card. Um, but if the password hash is still active, they can actually use that to gain access to the exact same account. So the n number eight will be insufficient ACLs on network shares and services. I used to know what ACL means, but I'm just assuming that there's not enough protocol privacy to keep the shares and services from different people. Uh, access control list. Oh. So basically, if you've got a big file share and the entire company is on it, um, that's kind of a red flag. Maybe separate based on concerns, right? People in finance should have access to finance documents. People in engineering should have engineering documents. Try not to mix user groups and use cases if you can avoid it. I know there's some cases where you can't, uh, and that's unfortunate, but it's business. You know, you take the risks when you have to. I mean, again, if you're on a home network and you have a shared whatever it is, I guess I would say if you don't need it logged in or mounted, I would unmount it. Mm -hmm. like if you're yeah. going to do something shady, just unmount it. Because if it's mounted and a ransomware attack happens, that's going with it. So yep. if you can unmount it, do that. Um, because most of the time you turn on your computer once. when Once you realize you need it, you mount it. Unmount it if you can. Otherwise, just think about that. If you're doing something more than that, obviously that's that's more of an like i said an enterprisey thing but 
I found it in my Synology to be not terrible to implement. You pick your users, you give them like you, it's just little check boxes and what they can have and what they can't have. You don't have to worry about your CH mod settings, but those are a thing. Okay, nine poor credential hygiene. This is just basically passwords. Okay, um, work with your company. Have have good passwords. We're not going to tell you how long, how short. Just the longer, the better. The more different the passwords are, the better it is. Don't go crazy because the more craziness you make your users go through, the more password one, two, three, four exclamation points you're going to get. That's yes. basically it. I uh, at one of the previous companies I worked at forever ago, um, I ran a check to see how many passwords were like you know summer twenty twenty three exclamation point. It was a lot. It was a whole lot. So if you're an end user, please don't make your password like season year exclamation point or whatever. Please, please don't. It's super easily guessable. It's super easily crackable. Uh, and if you're an IT admin, um, might want to run a check to make sure that that's not the case. I mean, I just... I don't like when they make it so difficult to create a password. Oh yeah. Like, I've run across some websites where even through Bitwarden, I can't create a password. Like I have to go one by one yep. to try and create the password. Don't do that. Don't. And the 90 day thing, um, that's not good. It's better so, to implement MFA if you can. Yeah. Over don't, the. Don't make people change their passwords. If you have to change them, like the whole reason that happened at the company I worked at is because we had a 30-day password rotation policy every 30 days. So the passwords went from May 2023, June 2023, and it just, it kept cycling on. You could get into half the accounts in the company if you knew what month it was and what year, uh, which is terrible. And the only reason that happened is because we made a wrong choice. The IT department made a wrong choice when it came to password rotation. Uh, what you should do is say, hey, make it long, make it complicated, you're not going to have to change it. That's the current recommendation. I wonder, can you run something to see if something's long? You can't, because if it's hashed, you can't tell how long it is. Right. So what you got to do is either do some hash cracking or, like, yeah. generate hashes and compare them to the list. And Like, there's, there's ways to do those kinds of checks that don't involve having to reverse uh, your, uh, your hashes. I guess what you do is, if it's under, you have everything under 60, under let's say eight characters in a rainbow table and if you find it you just tell the user to change their password yep is that what they do okay that, that's one of the there. ways you can do it yeah yeah okay and then the last one unrestricted code execution and i'm just looking at this as as don't just run code whenever don't allow your users just to run code i think this goes back to that separate account list and I don't know, on my Mac, it does it right. If I want to run something, the Mac pops up, put in your password. Windows you, used uh, UAC, user access control, would pop up. Are you sure you want to do that? And it like changes everything for you. I like that. You should have that turned on. And anytime you run something, obviously, are you sure you want to run this? Uh, blocking script execution is fantastic. And actually, I, I ran into this. I had to run a PowerShell script on my new system and it didn't let me by default, which is awesome. I, I had to go into some settings. I had to change some stuff as admin to allow PowerShell scripts to run on my, on my box. And it's fantastic. It means that by default, if I double clicked on something malicious, PowerShell would go, yeah, I'm not allowed to run any of this stuff, which is the proper default. So if you have PowerShell in your environment, uh, maybe take a look at the PowerShell execution policies and, um, you know, uh, lock that down. If you're a home user, don't randomly double click on any .bat files, any any batch files or any like PS1 or PowerShell files. I, unless you know what it does, don't just randomly run it, please. I mean, if you take all of these and drill them down, we always say the same thing. Update when you update everything. Think, think for yourself, think what's going on and change default passwords. I mean, I think those three things will keep you 99% of the way there. 
And these just 10 things, again, mainly for enterprise, but it's just really protecting you. And and it's not like, oh, I, I do this so I don't have to worry. No, as you audit your code, audit what you're installing and say, hey, did I do this? And see, because you'd be surprised. Things It's the plugging things back in. You did something, you forgot, you just left it. Or as somebody changed something, a setting got dropped or got added. So just check it out. And that's it. With that said, I don't have much. I don't think I have anything else to say about this. I got nothing. It's a good list. Okay. I really like this list. Definitely an enterprise bend, but uh, yeah, check it out. Uh, and especially if uh, if you're in charge of IT for an organization, absolutely check this list out. It's good. And they have links. They have a work cited page that you can click on. I mean, they all link to themselves, but anyway, on how to do a lot of these things. So that's great. So this will be in the show notes right there. Again, we have a signal group. If you want more about this, you're free to join. We, we have a lot of fun in there. So with that said, I'm, we're going to end and hopefully we'll see you next week. So bye, everybody. See you, everyone.